This morning we're going to look at the subject of the Prince of Peace. And we've read a few times over the last couple of days from Isaiah, but I'm going to read it again because I want these words that are in Isaiah chapter 9 to get into our into our minds and into our hearts. And you know what? When you teach children to remember and memorize things, one of the ways that you do it is through repetition. So when I'm going to keep I'm going to keep saying the word, I'm going to keep bringing it before you, because eventually we'll remember it, and it will get into our heart. But it says from verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdoms, to order and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He is the Prince of Peace. You know, there are many people around the world who are looking for peace. We've said this already. There are many people around the world who are looking for peace, but they are looking for it in the wrong place. Because, you know, we, you, may, you would have heard this at some point in your lifetime. The word said, the sin at the center is one letter. I. Me. Me, myself, and I. And it's interesting when I, and I'll just have a conversation before we started about self-indulgence and self-pleasure over Christmas. And it's interesting because food is not wrong, but if you overeat, you're going to get fat. And if you keep nicking the chocolates in the back of the shelf, you're going to as well. I was watching. Drink is not bad, but if you overdrink, it's bad. Spending money isn't bad. But if you overspend, it is. You're getting debt. Dare I say it? Going on holiday is not bad. But if you go on too many, it eventually becomes self indulgent and self pleasing and self seeking. It becomes bad. My grandmother used to say, because you've heard over the years about salt, everything in moderation. I never quite learned that I like salt, you know. I, um, I blame my mom for putting salt in a cookie when I blame my mom for everything. And I blame my mom for putting salt in the cookie when I was younger. I, in, fact, in fact, it was my dad, because he wanted salt. He was doing the age, he's telling me he was my dad, he wanted salt all in his food. So, salt in itself is not bad because it's seasoning. The Bible talks about being salt. But you know what? You can have too much salt and it blocks your arteries, makes them hard. And you have a heart attack at some point if you have too much. So the problem with many of us is that we look in the wrong place to get the thing that we need. And you see people, you know Mary Hill today, you know, what, what time did Mary Hill open this morning? Nine o'clock, eight o'clock? Is it even earlier than Christmas? I don't know, he stays open till midnight at some point. Who's the shadow that goes to Mary Hill at midnight? That's what I want to know. I hope it's not a horse, but he was like, you, you walk around there and you'll see people buying and spending and spending and buying and buying because they think the more they have at some point it's going to give them the peace that Bono talks about in U2 but his son encapsulated all if you remember from the 80s when Bono says I still haven't found what I'm looking for and many of us will go looking for peace in things but we'll never find it and yet in Ephesians in the New Testament, Ephesians 2, verse 14, he says, He himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments. In other words, we follow rules and regulations, but even they don't satisfy us. He himself is our peace. Jesus is the only one. Like I said, in the center of, of sin is I. I, 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 me, 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 me. And it's interesting when I hear people talk because when you make comments on certain things, you hear pushback. And the pushback is always, don't tell me what to do. I will do what I want. It's always me, I, me, 
I. It's, it's, it's always is. It's always the same. And as soon as I hear me, I, me, I, I'm thinking, here, here we go. Your flesh is talking again. Now, that, this may have been hard. You're glad you came on here. We know what, you know, I know my job, and I've known my job for some years, is to bring Christians to maturity. And sometimes you deal with a little child and you say, eat your cauliflower, don't eat your chocolate. They don't like it. But you know what? I could bring a cute little message to you, but it ain't going to do you any good. What we need is something to help us grow. And if Jesus has come as a priest of peace, then my heart is that everyone this Christmas and beyond experiences peace and lives in peace. And has peace. Because I tell you, you can have all the money in the world and no peace. And I tell you, we've had money, we've had no money. We've had money, we've had no money. And it's always better to have money. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, no matter what you say, I'd rather have money than no money. But I tell you this, I'd rather have no money and peace than have money and no peace. Because I've had peace, I've not had peace, and I've not had peace, it's not pleasant. You can survive with little money, but you know what? If you don't have peace, it destroys you. It gets in your head, it gets in your heart, and it just, it just eats at you. It's like a, a dare I use it, it's like a cancer that just gets in your heart and your life, and it starts to destroy you. And yet Jesus came. Why is it, of all the things that it could be in the Bible, it says he's wonderful, counselor, everlasting father, so we know his exceptions, and then the prince of peace. He could have said anything, but he puts peace, he puts peace with all those, because he knew peace was important. And he knew that in the days that we live now, and as we get older and the time goes on, peace is gonna become more scarce for many people. And there's gonna be more and more and more people who need peace, want peace, who look for peace in the wrong area. That's why you go down Broad Street in Birmingham and they'll be all over the floor, drunk as a skunk, is my phrase. I don't know if it's that acceptable in church, I've said it now, but anyway, the drunk is a skunk on the floor, throwing up, being sick, because they are trying to find peace and deal with whatever is going on inside of them to try and get some relief. And yet they're looking in the wrong place, but Ephesians tells me that Jesus is our peace. In Acts chapter 3, verse 15, it says that Jesus is the Prince of Life. Okay? Jesus is the Prince of Life. Now, it made me, I was curious, because I thought, well, if Jesus is the King of Kings, why is he called the Prince of Peace? But I wanted to know, what, did, what does a prince, what does that word mean? You know, me and words, what does the word prince mean? Now, the Greek for prince is the word God only knows how you pronounce it, but he spelled A-R-C-H-E-G-O-S, Archigos, or something like that. No idea, I'm not a Greek scholar. But what it means, the word prince means the one who stands at the head, the chief leader. Interesting. The chief leader, the one who's a prince. So if Jesus is the prince of peace, he's the chief leader of peace. He's the one who stands at the head, and in generally the one who's at the head in front of everybody else is the guy who's in, in charge. That's why you look at a football team, and when they when the Albion come out at 12 o'clock, see I'm sad, I know when they kick off. When the Albion come out at the Hawthorns to play at 12 o'clock, who comes out first? The guy who's in charge. On the pitch, the captain. So when Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he's the guy, in, he's the chief leader, he's the author, the captain, the one who's at the head. And it's interesting because he's not Prince with a little p, he's Prince with a capital P, which means he's the chief prince. He's the prince of all princes. So dear Prince William, there's someone better than him. I like William, to be fair, but, I, but there's someone better than, than William. He's called, his name is Jesus. Because Jesus is the prince of princes. But it's interesting because if you, if you Google it or go to a dictionary, what is a prince? A prince is someone who one day will become king. That's what he says. The prince is someone who one day becomes king. And it's interesting because in Philippians 2, it says there that Jesus humbled himself. And then God highly exalted him. And he gave him the name above every name. It's interesting because the way to, for Jesus to become the king of kings was to humble himself. 
when he was to die to self. Okay? Humility always leads to promotion. In the kingdom of God, humility always leads to promotion. Many, many promote themselves. It's funny, I watch in churches and I see, you know, Facebook's an interesting thing when you watch friends. And they look, they're all promoting themselves and look at me, look what I've done, look what I've done, look what I've done. And I, and I think, well, you know, God bless you. Nothing like being humble, is it? But humility always leads to Jesus humbled himself and God the Father exalted him. So he went from being the Prince of Peace to the King of Kings, the King of the Jews. He said, why was he originally called the Prince of Peace? Because Jesus offered himself as a peace offering. When he went to the cross, he went as a peace offering to sacrifice himself so that we can have peace. See, everything about Jesus is that he takes it upon himself so we don't have to be like that anymore. That's why he took sin um, he took sin upon himself so that we can be forgiven. He took sickness upon himself so that we can be healed. He took all that turmoil and distress and anguish upon himself so that we could have peace. And for, Chris, and for many people, Christmas is the time where they don't have peace. Because they remember loved ones, they remember people who've gone before them. They suddenly look at the bank balance and realise that they're in debt more than they thought they were. Or they've not, they're not all, they haven't bought what things that people expected of them. And yet, for many people, Christmas isn't about peace, it's about the lack of peace. Really. And yet Jesus says, I've come so that you may have peace. Many here have probably not experienced what the Bible in the New Testament talks about, the peace which passes all understanding. Where you can have chaos going on and you can be sat in the middle of the storm, fully at peace. When we went to South Africa, everyone used to say, you know, Johannesburg is the crime capital of the world. Okay? It's not Rio de Janeiro as it was years ago. It's Jack. Oh, I'm going to be, I was told off yesterday, I'm my backside, I'm going to get on fire with me. Another burning bump. Let me move forward. <laughs> now that would be a sight, wouldn't it? But when we lived in, when we lived in Johannesburg, they, people used to say, it's, a, it's the crime capital of the world. You know, you're going to get, you're going to get all sorts of things. And look, we had friends who were held up at gunpoint. You know, they were they were carjacked, they were hijacked, they were, you know, they were stuffed in wardrobes while their houses were emptied of all their, their goods, friends of ours. Um, you know, all these things were going on. And people lived in fear all the time. They would have big security, war security men. They loved dogs. They had big dogs. One family we had, they had 10 dogs. Five large outside dogs that would rip your head off and five indoor dogs that would walk forever. And that's, that's how people lived. They didn't have peace. They didn't have peace at all. And yet we went to a place that was a crime capital of the world. And I would walk, and this is true, I would walk down the street. I don't know if I was stupid or what, but people would say, don't walk anywhere. You've got to go to car. So they had the spa, we had the shop, the spa. And they had, there was one of them around the corner, don't walk there. There were crowds of people sat on the floor. You you know, they'll attack you. Nah. So I would just walk down the road in broad daylight and I'd just walk through the middle of these crowds of people. And they would just look at me like I was crazy. I don't know whether they were too flummoxed with me because they didn't expect me to walk in the middle of them. But everyone said, you can't do that because they'll beat you up, they'll attack you. No one ever did a thing to us, did they? We had a car that we never locked. In fact, we wanted to put a sign on the door saying, please, please steal, because it would have done us a favour. But, you know, it was, it was never stolen. We had cars that were stolen, friends whose cars that were stolen all the time. You know, you can be in the middle, one of my point is, you can be in the middle of that trouble and still be at peace. You can live on a desert island and have no peace. Because why? Because what's peace based on for many of us? For many of us, peace is based on our circumstances. 
and we want to run trying to spin the plates and we want to run trying to get all our ducks in a row and yet you know what peace is not based upon our circumstances we think if we change our circumstances we get peace peace if we change our circumstances and situations we may get a temporal temporal bit of peace little bit of peace we're like a ceasefire in our brain a little little bit of peace but you know what it's never going to be permanent because to get peace on the inside you cannot change external circumstances you've got to change the internal circumstances not the external the word peace means freedom from disturbance peace means the absence of hostility I like this one peace means sitting in comfort and so we think we well, you know what if I if I walk away from church I know you're not because you're here but I'm just saying, if you walk away from church that I'll be at peace if I don't talk to certain people I'll be at peace if I don't do this don't go there don't, I'll be at peace and you know what peace is not determined upon those external things it's determined by you and what's going on on the inter inside of you peace freedom from disturbance what's disturbing you on the inside what's disturbing you in your emotions what's disturbing you in your mind the absence of hostility some people are walking fight machines i've got a member in my family she's not for a fight with everybody yeah don't come in contact with her because she'll she'll take you on she just wants to fight because what's what's inside of her is disturbing her she's hostile now it would be nice to be sat in comfort but you know what how do we sit in comfort we don't sit in comfort on a chair we sit in comfort on the inside i'm at peace with whatever's thrown at me peace does not come from doing what we want peace comes and this is an important one, peace comes from living within the boundary of god's word that is why you hear me talk all the time about reading god's word studying god's word memorizing god's word why because if we know what god's word says then we know how to apply it to our life and we can live within the boundary of what god says yeah let me read i've got three verses one from psalms and let me apologize no powerpoint the week's been a whirlwind so um <clears throat> if i'm totally honest i completely forgot as well so there's just too much going on but peace, 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 Psalms 29. Be good if there was a chapter in the Bible called Peace. <laughs> Psalm 29, verse 11. The Lord will give strength to his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. So it's God's desire that he comes and gives us peace. He wants us to enjoy it. Proverbs chapter 12, just after Psalms. Proverbs 12, Proverbs 12, verse 20. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counsellors of peace will have joy. You know that counsellors of peace, what does that say? If you sow peace into people's lives, you'll get joy yourself. And I, we, know, we, we almost know those people who, you when you talk to them, they're going to stir up trouble. I know. Do you know? I will avoid certain people. Okay? You say, well, that's not Christian. Oh, it is. It's very Christian. Because I don't want them disturbing my peace. Because when I listen to them, you say, well, that contradicts. He doesn't contradict. Let me explain. Because certain people will intentionally try to destroy your peace. They will say things to you to get into your head. They will do things to you to get into your head. And those, are, and those are just the Christians. Yeah? So, so those people, the Bible encourages us to guard our hearts. Because I have, I have peace on the inside of me. And I'm not going to give it away to some plonker who wants to cause trouble. So I will not allow peace to be taken from me. Yeah? What does he say in Isaiah 26? Isaiah 26. I've said it, let me read it so you know I'm not making this up. God will keep you in perfect peace, whose mind he stayed on him. 
because we trust in him. I'm changing the tense here. God will keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him because we trust in him. Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Peace comes from having a mind that is focused on God. Because I tell you, I was awake at four o'clock this morning. I don't know why, Jenny was awake and I felt more awake at four o'clock this morning than I do now. But quite often what happens when you wake up in the middle of the night, I'm sure no one has this. You wake up in the middle of the night, then all of a sudden you'll have voices and you'll start to muse over things. And you know what? We never think about anything good do we when we wake up in the middle of the night. Generally, it's always bad. And it's things that get you worried and anxious. And how is this going to work? And how is that going to work? Where am I going to get the money from to do this? This person. And we stew over all these things. But it's important when those things happen that we, the Bible says about taking captive the thought and not allowing ourselves to dwell on those things because when we dwell on those things, it takes our peace. And yet the Bible is very clear there. He says, when our mind is stayed on him, he is our peace. Jenny's already read it this morning from John 14, that he is our peace. Peace of peace is a free gift. It is not something that we have to work to do. This is what, this is what baffles Christian people. Because quite often we think we've got to do something to earn it. I've got to do something. No, 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 this isn't about works. It's called the grace of God. You weren't saved by what you did. You were saved because you believed him. And this is exactly the same, same with peace. You don't get peace because you do something. You get peace because you believe that he is your peace. And you allow his peace to wash over your soul. Yeah? We had a friend, Tony, he's passed away now. He was knocked off his motorbike by a drunk driver. 24th, no, yeah, 24th of July, some years ago. And he used to say this, we were ordained uh, in, in the same stream, we were ordained and Tony, whenever you spoke to Tony, you would say this, and some of you may remember this being said years ago. He's certainly not said as much now. He would go up to you and he'd say, peace be unto you, my brother. You said, that's a religious thing. And then when he said that to you, my response would be, and unto you. Now we don't do that anymore because in this, these modern churches, why would we do something that is going to be so edifying? Let's go, let's go and get a Starbucks instead. But when, but when I'm saying, peace be to Steve, peace be unto you Steve, what am I saying? Because this is the meaning behind that. What am I saying is, Steve, health, prosperity and life are yours. That's the meaning of the phrase, peace be unto you, Teresa. Health, prosperity, and blessing are yours. Now, what a fabulous way to greet people. Health, blessing. Now, if you went up to someone in the street, they'd think you'd lost your marbles, wouldn't they? But you know what? It doesn't matter what they think. But we could do that to each other. Go up to you and say, Peace be unto you, Andy. And unto you, my brother. No, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying we've got to get religious here. But just understand the meaning that we are speaking life and blessing and peace and health to each other. What a fabulous place to be. I think that's a fabulous place to be because we know peace comes from the word shalom and shalom means nothing missing, nothing broken in our lives. That's the original meaning of the word. So wouldn't it be a great greeting every time we met each other? Peace be unto you, doggy. She may slap you and say, you know what you're talking about, I'm joking. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we do well to say that to each other whenever we meet with each other. Peace be unto you. Now, if you watch Catfire, do you remember Catfire? If you ever watch Catfire, I love Catfire. The monk who's a detective with his shaved head. I, love, I, love, I'm just, I just love Catfire. I don't know why, it's just what it just appeals to me. But if you listen to Catfire on telly, the monk, that's what they do. The monastic monk from the abbey, they will generally go to each other and they will greet each other, peace be unto you. 
What a blessing. We've spoken about the blessing this morning. What a thing to bless somebody and say, health, prosperity, blessing is yours today. I'll ask some of that. You can say it to me. Because there's a, there's a thing in yeah, Christendom where we have to learn to speak life over each other. I want to go to Psalms 19 and, I've, and, I'm, and I'm nearly finished. Some of you said, Amen, I'm pleased. Psalm 119, verse 15. It says, Psalm 119, verse 15 and 16. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. You think, well, that's, that's cool. What's that all about? I've split it down because how do we get peace? We get peace by doing the following. He says there, I will meditate on your precepts. The word meditate is not to sit cross-legged and go, mm, that's not meditate. You know what I mean? The world has stolen that from the church. The word meditate means to chew over. Now, some of you chew over not having enough money. Some of you chew over somebody who said something nasty to you. Some of you will chew over what food you're going to eat. You, you'll chew over that. You keep thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And your brain's going bonkers thinking about all these things. Trying to get a solution. And yet, he says here, I will chew over, change the word, your precepts. What God says in his word, we've got to chew over. He says, we, and I will contemplate your ways. The word contemplate means to look and observe and study thoughtfully. That is why I say about reading the word and studying the word. You can't read it, you can't avoid it. I've got this statistic that I saw this week. 40, a survey in Britain came out recently. I think it was a Christian concern who published it. He said this, 40% 40, 40 of Christians never, never read the Bible. 40% in a survey of several thousand people, 40% of Christians never read the Bible. And I'm, stand, I'm stood here saying, more fool anybody who doesn't. Because how on earth are we going to get life into us if we don't meditate, contemplate God's word? And it says, and delight. In other words, we, have, we take pleasure. We look forward to reading the word and what God's going to say to me from it. And, though, and I like that, the, the, the final sentence, I will not forget your word. I bet you've never read a psalm, got to the end and thought, how did I get here? And then you don't even know what you've read and you have to do it again. <laughs> or am I the only one who's ever done that? No, you read it through and then you think, I have no clue what I just read. Let me start again. Thankfully, it's only short and it's not Psalm 119. That takes you off an hour. But it's just like you think, oh, let me do it again. And even then, sometimes I've done it a second time and I still, I still didn't have a clue what I read. And I have to do it again. But now I can understand why the Bible says, I will not forget your word. Because even that, we forget instantly what we've read. So how can the Bible change our lives? Let's go to Philippians, and I'll finish in just a couple of minutes. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. He says this, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. And that's where many of us make the mistake because we look everywhere bar Jesus. Where can I find peace? Where can I sort things out? Where, 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 where? And the very thing is staring us in the face and the very thing we need to do is the very thing we don't do. 40% of Christians. So, so that's, if you just imagine half, so, split Trevor and Cavalier, right? You guys never read your Bible ever. What you guys do? Just imagine. 
this, this group of people here never ever read the Bible. That's what he's saying. And then you come to understand why Christians are in a mess at times. Because they don't put time in to read it. Because bear in mind, if in the book of John, the, it says, Sue read this last night, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Word became flesh. So if you want to know about Jesus, what do you read? The Word. If you want to know about him, you read, you spend time in this book. If you studied economics, I studied A level economics, I love economics. I studied that. What did I read? Every economics book that was in the library. We didn't have Google back then. Every economics book that was in, whether it be House or in Library, Netherton Library, Dudley Library, or even Birmingham Library at the time. Every book I could find on the subject, I read. Then accounts, I would read the books on a campus. Quite sad, really. Because I wanted to find out about the subject. If you want to find out about Jesus and the Prince of Peace, you read the newspaper, don't you? You spend time in the Word. So my, my application this morning is you say, well, I can't find peace. I need peace. My, my, my question for you to think on Think on these things when you leave today. What is on the inside of you that is disturbing you? What is on the inside of you? And where are you looking for peace? Because the Prince of Peace is available to us. And we know he's a, he's a gentleman. He's not going to come and force himself on anybody. But he's there waiting and saying, listen, let me help you. Let me help you this morning. You know, we need to be at peace with ourselves. We need to be at peace with others, and we're more importantly, we need to be at peace with God. Because it's from being at peace with God that everything else will flow. See, we cannot live without peace. Because for some people, it affects them physically. That lack of peace in their lives makes them sick. And I, and I am convinced that many people are sick because of emotional, mental turmoil, unforgiveness, things that they've he held on to in their lives that have robbed them of their peace. And for some of us to find peace is Christmas, we welcome Jesus in. But in welcoming Jesus in, we've got to let go of contention, we've got to let go of strife, we've got to forgive people, we've got to hand over to him those things that, have allowed, that we've allowed him to take our peace. We've got to identify them and let them go. We've all sung the song, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. And we sing it, but we don't do what we sing. All to Jesus I sometimes surrender. Sometimes I will give when I choose what I want to give. That's what we're singing. But the word says, I love the hymn, okay? This is, this is my all-time hymn. Maybe it's because of being in the tent of what Cinder Bank as, as, as a lad, but listening to Billy Graham. Just as I am with that one plea. That is my all time favourite hymn. Just as I am with that one plea, for your blood was shed for me. That, I tell you, I'll, even though just saying it, it makes me cry. It is the best hymn ever. Best hymn ever. Because we don't come to him cleaned up, we come to him a mess. And he cleans us up. That's the beauty of Jesus. He doesn't say, get peace, then come to me. He says, come to me as you are, just as I am. And I'll clean you up. The Prince of Peace is King Jesus. And he wants this year to give you peace with your past, peace with your present, peace with yourself, and peace with God. Our job is to let go of the turmoil and do what the word says in Psalm 119 and Philippians 2, Philippians 4. Change our focus, change our perspective, change where we look, change where we're looking for peace. Because that I in the middle of sin, I, 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 me, 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 always gets in the way. 
and we will look and we will look and that self-pleasure that we seek and that self-indulgent side of, of human beings which is called the flesh by the way which the bible talks about getting under control because the flesh will always cause you to do things that pull you away from god and peace is of god and god wants to give us peace this morning amen so maybe a different message to what you expected but probably they are, they are every week to be fair but you know we've got to be open to let the king of glory the king of peace come into our life 